Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special lecture today. Please welcome the president of the New Century Healthcare Promotion Foundation, Dr. Wen Bing Lian, to give the welcome remarks. Good morning, Dr. Hong Chi Hui, uh, President of the Academy uh, Sinica, the uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Elizabeth Blackwell, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the uh, New Century Health Care Promotion Foundation, I wish to express my warmest welcome to you all to this scientific meeting. Our foundation was founded in December 1997 with a vision to improve the quality and the quantity of scientific research in Taiwan. Since then, we have held high-level scientific meetings every year with the honor of having invited many world-renowned science scholars, including my Nobel laureate, as our keynote speakers over the past 20 years. This year, the scientific meeting entitled Advancing Terapia Biology, we are very fortunate to have Professor Elizabeth Blackwell, Nobel laureate in the biology of medicine, as our honorable guest speaker. On behalf of the foundation, I wish to extend my request appreciation to Professor Blackwell for her kindness in accepting our invitation in joining us all the way from the United States. We also wish to thank uh, Dr. Wong Chi Hui, President of the uh, Academy of Civica and the Associate for their kind assist to organize uh, this uh, meeting. Dr. Brad Wong is currently Professor of the Department of Biochemistry and uh, Biophysics and also Department of Microbiology and Immunology in the University of California, San Francisco. <coughs> he, uh, she was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in the Biology or Medicine in 2009 for the uh, discovery of how uh, uh, chromosomes are protected by uh, telomere, telomeres and the uh, enzyme telomeres. Uh, her important work of the fundamental mechanism of the uh, cells has been recognized. Uh, this discovery uh, surely and significantly stimulated the development of the new therapeutic strategy. Now we have a pleasure to invite uh, President Trump to make opening remarks and uh, chair this uh, Nobel election. Thank you very much.
Academia Sinica uh, has been involved in these activities, and we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be part of this. And uh, today we have a very special uh, uh, lecture uh, coming from the U.S. <coughs> and as you know, uh, Elizabeth uh, Beckman is the recipient of the uh, 2009 Nobel Prize in Geology of Medicine for the discovery of Terramia and Terramarais. And because of the work, uh, uh, the field has uh, been very advanced today and uh, helped us understand many of the new uh, mechanisms associated with the normal cell uh, function and also disease progression. And it also has given rise to uh, new areas for study, uh, for example, cancer biology, and aging related disease, and stress. And Professor Beckman is currently the Morris first time in large chair in biology and physiology in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, she was originally from Australia, uh, receiving her uh, undergraduate education Master education in the field of biochemistry, and then she received her PhD in uh, molecular biology from the University of Cambridge. And then uh, she went to Yale uh, to do her postdoc research in molecular biology and cell biology. And throughout her distinguished career, uh, Dr. Blackburn has made many, many important contributions in research, education, and service. Uh, she also has held many leadership positions in uh, several scientific organizations, including, for example, the most recent uh, tenure as president of the American Association for Cancer Research. Uh, in recognition of her uh, accomplishment, in the field of terminal biology. Uh, she has received numerous awards and honors, uh, including, for example, the 2006 Albert Glasgow Award for Basic uh, Medical Research, and elections to uh, the Institute of Medicine, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and National Academy of Sciences. In 2007, uh, Time Magazine uh, named her one of the 100 most influential people uh, in the world. And in 2008, uh, she received uh, the Oreo UNESCO for uh, Women in Science Award. And I think this is the, uh, the uh, North American uh, Award for this uh, recognition. And the 2009 uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology. So we are very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to invite uh, uh, Professor Beckman to visit us. And uh, 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 she will talk about uh, telomere and telomerase, their implications for human health and disease. Let's welcome Professor Beckman. Thank, thank you so much, President Wong for this very kind introduction and for the invitation to visit Taiwan. I'm just simply honored and delighted to be here for my first visit to Taiwan. And so it's especially a privilege and a pleasure to be able to address you here today. Now I'm going to talk about research that I've done and have been involved in over the years. And a point I want to make is that there's this almost seamless interaction between basic sciences and what we might think about as applied and clinical sciences. And I hope that becomes clear as I unfold uh, my talk. Now, uh, first of all, when I give a public presentation, I make a disclosure. I'm a co-founder of a company, a small company, uh, but although none of the research I'm talking about today is done in connection with the company, but I need to give you the disclosure. So, let's think about medicine. Medicine has had huge triumphs, and particularly 
in the field of taking the urgent situations of advanced diseases of all kinds, infectious diseases, injuries, some of the more chronic diseases, and being able to treat them. And of course that comes with, a, uh, as we think of this progression here, it's, it's a progression from a situation that didn't exist before, pre-disease, various stages of diseases, and having no disease at all, to perhaps being able to preempt or intercept disease at different stages. But mostly, modern medicine, from necessity, has had to deal with the situation which we can draw an analogy to by thinking of a burning house, a drastically serious situation, fire at a call to the scene, with great skill, heroism, expertise, they manage to often, we hope, put the fire out, but also there's often also, also damage done in the process. Now, why can we even start thinking about uh, this being not the only approach to disease? Well, what's been happening is because of the greatly advances in basic science, clinical science, the clinic uh, technologies, more and more advances in understanding the disease etiology and the biology underlying disease has enabled one, us to understand more and more this progression and to understand more and more where there may be ways that one can start intervening earlier and earlier in the process. And so ideally, what we would look forward to, without ignoring the necessity to deal, of course, with the urgent situations of advanced diseases currently in people, but to take advantage of all the things that have been learned about diseases to think more and more about incorporating into medicine the idea that you would uh, be able to perhaps even catch their, uh, diseases at their earlier stages if we know enough about them so we can preempt disease. So that's the general framework in which I want to uh, have you just think about the kind of things that I'm going to be telling you about today. And it's going to begin with very basic science because that is the important point, is that the basic science, as I mentioned, uh, in our, uh, has become seamlessly integrated and uh, iteratively um, interacting with uh, how one can think about this in the general area of human health and disease. Of course, when we think about understanding disease etiology and biology, of course we know there will be all these sorts of influences. Genetic, which is uh, you know very much an active field at the moment, but only that's only very much a part of the picture as I understand as non-genetic is also important. So what are two things? Lombrays, I'll talk about the basic science first, just so we get all on the same page, and the important principles which then can start to be incorporated into the much more complex situation of what actually um, happens in people. So uh, telomeres are the ends of chromosomes, so this shows a picture under the microscope of chromosomes which are lit up in blue, with the double uh, objects being newly replicated chromatids, the DNA stained in blue, all the genetic material, of course, is in this DNA, all the genetic instructions, and then the um, uh, telomeres are lit up by a molecular probe that picks up common uh, DNA at the end of all of these chromosomes. And these form protective caps, and this was understood from cytogenetics analysis under the microscope combined with genetics, understanding that something had to be at the ends of chromosomes to confer protection in distinction from DNA breaks. Um, and then I had the good fortune in the 1970s uh, to learn some techniques of how to analyze DNA sequences in ways that were very applicable to these ends of chromosomes and to join the lab of Dr. Joe Ball at uh, Yale University, where um, what I was able to find was that there was actually um, a molecular nature to at least the DNA part of the telomere, and that was that it was made up of very simple repeated DNA sequences. And, uh, and I had the good fortune to have a marvelous connection with Taiwan through this, because in the same group that we published together was uh, Yao Ming Chao, director Yao Ming Chao, who was the um, director of the molecular, of the Institute of Molecular Biology here in Taiwan. So we were postdoctoral fellows together at Yale, and we extended some of this um, to, to, uh, to show that this wasn't just peculiarly to certain DNAs, but actually started to extend to others. That principle then, by many other groups as well, then started to extend to the vast majority of eukaryotes, that is to say, organisms on the planet that are not bacteria. So the sequence of DNA uh, is there, and I'll show the human form just at the very end, it's a very simplified form. 
It's a repeated motif, this is the human version, and it serves as a collection of sequences to which protective proteins bind. And that's the important point, is that the DNA sequences are required to bind the protective proteins. And so, a little more detail, and I'm not going to be naming the individual members of all this very complex, interesting class of proteins, but they're there, and they bind single and double-stranded DNA materials. Themselves, they bind other proteins, forming a very dynamic complex whose um, actual dynamic nature is still very much under study. But at least we have the, um, the parts list. What we don't know is how they all really work dynamically. That's very interesting to understand, because if this uh, <coughs> array of repeats gets too short, and it doesn't have to get too much shorter in humans, then what happens is that this uh, shortening, which can, uh, you know, erode, erosion of the telomeres, can have very severe effects on cells. And the reason that this is important is that without such a protective structure, which requires a minimal length of this DNA to work uh, properly as a protective structure, then degradative processes with enzymes inside the cells can take place, and chromosome ends losing the protective structure can even stick to each other, and uh, that can, of course, lead to genomic instability. So there's real consequences to not having this structure. Now, why would telomeres erode? There was a long-standing question many years ago from the nature of the molecule, the, sorry, the enzymes that replicate DNA. It was recognized many decades ago that, in fact, there was a problem in DNA um, replication of a linear DNA. I won't go through the details, but the prediction was a linear DNA, such as a chromosomal DNA, would have a problem <coughs> which would be that the DNA would be lost from the endos uh, because of an incomplete replication. So this was a fundamental problem of DNA replication known from the enzymology of the enzymes that replicate the rest of the chromosome and how is this solved. Um, to cut a long story short, uh, what we were able to do um, in my group at Berkeley was to use a synthetic DNA oligonucleotide, which is shown the building blocks of the DNA <coughs> color here. This is mimicking uh, what our best guess for a telomeric DNA end would look like uh, in the synthetic form, and by uh, using appropriate uh, conditions and the ciliated protozoan tetrahymena, a single cell organism with a very large number of linear chromosomes. And that was the beauty of it, and this was a discovery that Meng Chaiyao here was very instrumental in. So knowing that there were large numbers of linear chromosomes gave one a lot of DNA at the end, and we thought perhaps there would be a lot of this potential activity that from various lines of evidence we wondered if this existed, and so my lab we were able to show that in fact there was an enzymatic activity that elongates chromosome ends. A little more detail, it would be the end of the chromosome. Again, very simplified, very schematic, and um, <coughs> interestingly, this enzymatic activity was very unusual for a, a, a cellular enzyme because it had a reverse transcriptase activity, enzymatic activity, that copied a small portion of a larger RNA that we discovered was in this enzyme ribonuclear protein complex, and by adding nucleotides could elongate the chromosomal DNA directed by the bases in this uh, short portion of the larger RNA, which is an important part as a whole of the RNA of the enzymatic activity of this protein. And this protein is much larger than the reverse transcriptase, has a number of interesting functions. In a lecture tomorrow, I'll give at National Taiwan University College of Medicine, I'll talk about some other things we're discovering about the protein. Okay, so what did it do for cells? Uh, we used the ciliated protozoan tetrahymena because, as I said, uh, first of all, we knew there was enzymatic activity. Secondly, a very convenient fact is that this organism is in effect immortal. If you feed it, and as we used to say, talk to it nice, <laughs> then it will keep on multiplying, <coughs> and the cells maintain telomeres of some length distribution. They have telomerase. Were those two facts related? The genetic test was to mutate the telomerase uh, in a way that was very sort of surgical. It was actually just a very precise change to the telomerase RNA component. And we got lucky. We didn't know this would work, but it did, because what happened was that the telomeres 
progressively shortened when we just made this change. And I won't go into all the details of how that had to be built up into a, a, a molecular system to study this, but it was possible to do it uh, by work of a number of different groups making the technologies possible and eventually the cells cease to divide. So we had sort of struck at the heart of the ability of these cells to be immortal. So that was the, the genetic result. And, uh, and the reason I'm going through this is not just history, but because that was the general principle that then turned out to be found throughout the vast majority of eukaryotes that use this mechanism to maintain the protective structures of the ends. There are obstructive uh, <coughs> exceptions, the exceptions are always constructive, but this is the great majority of the situation in eukaryotes that they use telomerase as their major pathway for maintaining the chromosomal DNA um, lengths. So, so adding a few more names here, you know, the RNA component in humans uh, has got various names. The uh, protein core component is called TERT in very, uh, human TERT in the case of humans. There are certainly other proteins here, and important regulatory factors at the telomeres themselves play a great many important roles in regulating the action of telomerase, which is highly regulated in human cells in particular. So the point being that it maintains chromosome X. So, so without telomerase, then you have a situation where telomeres do shorten. And now this generalizes, and one can now see evidence that this happens not just in culture, but in, in humans. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. But what has been learned about this is that when the telomeres become too short, they do signal the cells. They use in large part DNA damage signal pathways, and that then sends a strong signal to cells to cease multiplying. And so the prediction that was made by Lopnikov, you know, years ago, uh, you know, that maybe this would cause senescence without knowing molecularly what was going on, turned out to be remarkably correct. And indeed, that is a real explanation for a certain form of senescence of, say, human cells, and one can see it in cells growth in culture if you don't have telomerase activity or not enough. That, in turn, leads to very interesting changes in cell programs. And that was not expected, because the cells that cease multiplying can also change their functionality. And I'll talk more about that. And if signals that tell the cells normally to just cease dividing are, are abrogated, and that can happen in cancer progression as cancer cells lose the signals that will um, instruct the cells not to multiply when there's DNA damage. That then can allow the ends to fuse, and then the cells that keep on multiplying then will start to have genomic instability. So this is thought to be one potential contributor to um, one of the ways that, uh, one of the many changes that take place in cancer cells. Not the only one, by any means. So, so now I'm going to get to, um, you know, cutting out a lot of basic science done in a great many labs, understanding more and more those features of telomerase, the interactions with proteins and telomeres, the regulation, the DNA damage signaling resulting from insufficient maintenance. That basic science has been advanced very much by many labs over the years and continues to advance. There are many open questions still, many, but the more and more, um, one has started to think about what the implications of this, clinically and otherwise. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about, because uh, again, it's, it's basic science in a way, but now we're, we're looking at a very interesting organism on the planet, it happens to be called humans, and uh, you know, we're the best phenotype species on the planet, there's a great deal of detail that we know about us, so we're a really fascinating species to study, in, and, and our lens has been the telomere maintenance system that I, you know, personally in our group have been interested in, but by collaborating with a great many others who have these interests in humans and clinical and other implications, it's been a very interesting um, sort of interactive uh, set of understandings and of trying to understand you know, what does go on uh, in humans. And so uh, one way of framing one form of the question is the question of, well, well you know, how do we age, right? This familiar sequence. Um, and, and obviously this has multiple dimensions and it's a big issue demographically around the world today as a 
populations around the world in many societies more and more are aging, uh, in part because of the improvements in economic and health and medical advances. So we now have this big issue demographically, and I won't put all the statistics up, but it's very real. And of course, it has multiple dimensions, you know, social, economic, personal, family, health, and otherwise, and cognitively, and so on. But one particular aspect of this very multifaceted process is the one that, interestingly enough, and not necessarily was it expected, that telomere maintenance relates to. And that's the unwelcome aspect of aging. You know, maybe there's some welcome aspects, like maybe we gain some wisdom. That's our story. We're sticking to it. <laughs> right. But, you know, the unwelcome aspect of aging, of course, is the increased susceptibility to diseases of a variety of kinds. And particularly in the developed societies around the world, there are three big ones of cancers, diabetes, um, uh, heart disease. Those are the big prominent categories that are, are, ca are causing so much morbidity and mortality in the elderly in um, you know, ways that uh, increase with age. And so obviously we can think about modifiers of this as well. This uh, computer simulation simulates a person, uh, two, two individuals of equal age, this is just a, a computer simulation, but for the same aged person, someone who didn't smoke and someone who did, uh, does smoke, and there's clear you know, aging uh, phenotypes associated with that. So this is um, obviously going to incorporate non-genetic aspects as well. So uh, measuring telomere length can be done quite accurately by various techniques and in ways that can be done with uh, population cohorts these days and even smaller study groups and so one can quantify what's happening with telomeres because as I showed you in tetrahymena, the telomeres progressively shorten before the cells cease dividing. Now, so, so just to um, sort of put an overview quickly, uh, some st cells, you know, in fact have telomerase in quite large quite a quantities actually. Uh, and so, interestingly, you can ask, for example, in hemopoietic stem cells what happens as we go through the decades of aging. And interestingly enough, despite the fact that they have quite robust telomerase activity, Peter Lansdorff in particular has shown in extensive studies from Vancouver and Canada that there's actually an average shortening of telomeres in even the stem cell compartments of the hemopoietic system. So, so in fact, there was this trend even in stem cells with adequate telomerase. So now you can see this is not going to be a simple situation. And so the predictions meant there were no a priori predictions. So we had to actually look at what the situation was. You know, this wasn't really predicted. It had to be examined directly um, by looking at uh, human studies. And so the um, so summary is, is that in many cell types, in humans, uh, in adults, and even in children, there's a general trend, and that is that the telomerase seems to be insufficient to counterbalance the various shortening processes. So there's evidence that in at least some cells, as people age, and even in younger individuals, this kind of thing can happen. So the question then was, if this is happening at a cellular level, we know that aging is you know, the whole organism, diseases involve the whole organism, is this involved in the organismal situation? You know, does this relate to um, something going on in humans? Because this is really cellular uh, cell biology here, individual cells. Um, you know, is this analogous to, if you will, candle burning down? You know, the telomere shortening. Is this metaphorical idea actually the case in humans? And this is counteracted, as I said, by telomerase. And so it's important then to quantify telomerase too, which we do now in studies uh, in cells, normal human cells, to understand what's going on. So in brief, what one finds is that telomerase is actually highly active in a, a cell type which is very unwelcome in terms of its multiplying capacity, and that is human tumors. And, and that makes sense because of the greatly increased proliferative nature of a great many human tumors. I will not deal with that really in this lecture today, except to say it's a common characteristic of human tumors. It may well be a targetable process in terms of therapeutics, which are at early stages uh, for various reasons to do more with industry than really uh, anything else. 
and I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting property, which frankly uh, it remains, I think, to be exploited, but definitely should be thought about as one thinks about very challenging areas of developing cancer therapeutics, which we know are being very challenging, even with targeted therapies, we are seeing the limitations of that. So we really have to think about every element. More uh, today, uh, what I really will focus on today, is the situation that is in normal cells. Uh, and that's very interesting because it's a, it is not just simply yes, no. As you saw even in the hemopoietic stem cell situation, you know, quite you know, adequate seeming levels of telomerase you would have thought, you still see in the decades of human life, on average, telomeres shortening. Telomerase is on in stem cell compartments and in the lineages that give rise to germ cells. Um, and now the question is, you know, is it just always in this direction? And, and I should say right away that from the world of immunology studies, um, Richard Hodes' group, for example, Wang and they showed quite clearly that in B cells, as they differentiate in the germinal centers in adults, the telomerase uh, counterbalancing is actually pushed in the other direction. Telomeres get longer in the differentiated B cells in the germinal centers in adults. So it doesn't inevitably have to be all one way because telomerase is present in cells and even in cells that are not stem cells. We even find it when we quantify carefully, we find it in many normal adult cell types. So it is not zero. One, it is very nuanced. What that meant is that it, there was no a priori predictions that one could actually make in, in humans. So I focus on this aspect. So what do we find if one does observe in human populations and cohorts and studies uh, with respect to uh, measuring telomeres just even in the most simple-minded way uh, just looking at the population of white blood cells that are in, for example, a blood draw. And it's been remarkably informative. Because to summarize, what's been happening is that one finds that diseases and shorter telomeres are indeed quantitatively associated. So there's a quantitative trait-like property of shortness of telomeres, the measure of the average telomere length, even something as simple as that, with a multiplicity of diseases. And this is all you know, corrected for by all sorts of other um, factors as one has to do in such statistical studies. These are statistical analyses to begin with here. But the diseases are very interesting diseases because these are the ones that A, are noticeable um, age-related uh, you know, uh, incidences. And secondly, these are big diseases that represent large health issues. Uh, in general, impaired immune function, uh, one sees by various measures, shortness of telomeres related to that. Interestingly, certain kinds of cancers, there's no question that there's, a, that there's real uh, predictive things. And I'm going to show you a couple of bits of data from a couple of studies, not ours, but just examples uh, right away. Uh, lung disease of various kinds, in emphysemas as well as um, pulmonary fibrosis, heart disease of various forms. Even diabetes, very interesting, that's an important one, and vascular dementia and other dementias now, osteoarthritis and, and so on, risk factors. So there's a wide variety of things. So shorter telomeres, right away, we're not talking about a diagnostic for a specific disease. This is very different from when one needs to find out, say, the source of an infectious, so one can treat the infectious agent with a highly specific agent or a particularly you've got a broken leg, you've got to find out why that leg is swollen, and then treat it as a broken leg rather than, you know, uh, you know rheumatoid arthritis or something. You, you know, in other words, medicine has very much and appropriately focused on highly specific diagnostics. And so when you were looking at something where there's an association with a lot of things. However, the important point is in populations of people Many of these are co-orbit. You have a risk for one when you have the other and vice versa. So that's a different kind of way of thinking about this and more and more that's being recognized as that's what's happening in, in people. And it's been well known for a while. So what might be um, biologically related 
to this association that I told you about, where I just told you that these are statistical associations of risks uh, and incidences uh, of these great you know, variety of the uh, common diseases. Uh, and so human genetics and the human clinic have been very informative. And now we have all this basic science. We know what's going on at the molecular cell level, right? So now uh, uh, individuals who have the misfortune to have a genetic mutation that causes their telomerase level to be only about half the normal level are very instructive. Now they're fortunately rare, but there are now scores of different families because the world population is so huge, even rare diseases can you know, show up. And so various diseases that cause pretty much this to happen um, have been very uh, instructive. So what have we learned? From the rare mutations, that as I said, worldwide they now add up to scores, dozens, scores of different incidences of these sporadic diseases that lower telomerase, they don't cut it up all together, probably incompatible, incompatible with viability, but that just lower telomerase in humans, I'm talking about humans here, but, and we know the causality is there because the genetics is rigorously done and they cause disease. So if you have the bad luck that, you know, if you're a gambler, you think of, you know, just luck, where will the, you know, the dice fall with respect to your genetic disposition? So you have the bad luck that you received, you know, a bad gene from one or other parent for telomerase, and these are just examples of the telomerase components in which such mutations have been found. That we know in a causal way it causes telomeres to be markedly shorter than in the population at large and family controls. That in turn we know has an impact on disease and what's very interesting is that now more and more is being known about what happens in humans and it's got a very interesting overlap with what I just showed you is the associations which are seen simply statistically as associations without causality applied in those human population studies. Here we have causality and we have a remarkable overlap. So I think we would be extremely foolish not to draw some information from this fact here. So here's, here's the interesting set of things, immune system failure. And these are now much more severe and much earlier than their onset typically in the population at large, but they cover the same sorts of organs. And so in fact, a lot of studies have now been done, and this is very busy, uh, it's in the review which is out now, so we can read more of it if you want to. But the point of this is to show that in the human situation, so on this left column, and in the mouse models, of which there are excellent mouse models um, reducing or removing telomerase, what you, the point is the great variety of organs and cells in which such telomerase um, deficiencies and short tel cause of short telomeres have been implicated. They cover not only, as expected, the high turnover tissues, because as I told you, you know, stem cells have telomerase and you can imagine stem cell compartments would run out. I'll talk about that in a minute, but also, um, also slower turnover tissues. And so the point is that such a big variety of different disease types, different tissue types, cell types, and different organ types. So very interesting because, you know, as I said, none of this could be predicted a priori by simply changing by 50% uh, in these cases the level of telomerase enzyme because we know so many different genes affect telomere length and so many other factors, as I will tell you soon. So I think it's quite interesting that telomerase turns out to be in the range from 100% down to 50%, at least certainly around on the 50% level, it's limiting in humans in terms of uh, you know, getting through life. Because these individuals, uh, you know, sadly, they do die much earlier than they ought to die of various manifestations that I've just mentioned. So what's going on in the disease processes? Again, the combination of going back and forth iteratively between the mouse models and the human models and the, and the human disease situation to the mouse models, you know, has been a very instructive back and forth. Each has informed the other. But now I think this is really starting to be an understanding of what might be going on. Again, this is in this review that we published uh, a couple of months ago. And first of all, 
we can see in the high turnover tissues, uh, the ones that rely on stem cell compartments to continue actively renewing, we can start to see that in a normal situation, like in the hemopoietic compartment, of course, there will be all the different cell types continuously produced with a big demand on the stem cell um, pools throughout life. And clear evidence exists that that pool becomes diminished in individuals with only half the amount of telomerase and whose telomeres have got shorter and shorter uh, much more rapidly than normal. And they've inherited shorter telomeres if the mutation came from you know, a parent, uh, and so, which, which you know, it comes from. But sometimes you can see evidence that the spontaneous mutation might have occurred in the parent and then the grandparents are OK. Anyway, so that just diminishes all the different kinds of uh, cell types produced once he's eventually bone marrow failure and uh, immunosenescence, a very severe mimic of what does happen, happen in the population at large, but much severer, much earlier. Similarly, uh, in the intestinal lining, this just showing the crypts of the intestine, uh, which are continually renewed, so the lining of the gut is requiring this continuous stem cell production of this, and you just lose uh, bilis eventually without adequate telomerase. But the interesting thing that's now emerging from um, really studying, initially it was actually senescent cells, and Judy Campisi's group at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and California was very instrumental in the first finding of this. That is that in a cell that has telomeres that are too short, not only does that cell cease to multiply so long as all its checkpoints are intact, but you know, I've just talked about that situation. If it's a stem cell, and it would be true for any other cells that have to have some proliferative capability, but that cell now reprograms its whole transcriptional program. It's a sustained DNA damage signaling that sets in train this complex reprogramming, which will, of course, be very instructive to understand and groups are involved in trying to understand this. But what you get is uh, uh, factors that are both pro-inflammatory and tumorigenic now being produced by the senescent cells themselves. These now, when secreted, can now influence other cells. So these are now not only cell autonomous effects of simply losing the ability to proliferate. So one thing you know, will be eventually, this can be added to replicative exhaustion, the cells themselves can't replenish. But very importantly, now these changes now can affect other cells. And we think that a way to think about this is to think about this is one hit that's happened, and then other disease processes happen. And just to give a simple example, in the case of cigarette smoke, that greatly increases the emphysema in mice that are forced to inhale cigarette smoke in the laboratory setting. And when you add this to this telomere shortness situation, you get a greatly uh, enhanced um, emphysema uh, phenotype, for example. So there's a real interaction uh, which one can demonstrate, and which statistically, in human studies, there is an association. So there's a case where there's you know, two kinds of things. One is an environmental chemical uh, situation, uh, the, the cigarette smoke components, and the other is the uh, underlying situation. And then, for example, other kinds of damage. Uh, and I've just given one example here. So the idea is we add to this all of the kinds of processes that we know are important in disease uh, processes, and they'll be different in different organ types. Uh, an example I didn't put up, but which is relevant here perhaps, is that in the uh, beta cells of the pancreas, which of course is important for insulin uh, production responses, this setting makes those cells, even though they haven't disappeared in the air, but if they have this setting of short telomeres and DNA damage, they actually respond inappropriately to insulin. So even though they're not lost, it's not even a lost yet in the stem cell compartment, they're malfunctioning as, as another example of a, a different kind of transcriptional change. So basically, what we know then from the genetic studies is a causality. I just told you the genetic studies that really show causality in terms of this is one, uh, one impact. I'm saying impact because obviously it's interacting with disease-causing processes. But this is very clear that that can happen. Now, one of, so, so let's look at a few examples of data in humans. Um, I'm going to give you some of the studies that have been done, and then at the end I'll update you with some findings of a very large study we're doing uh, 
uh, but these smaller cohort studies, smaller studies that are very important for framing the questions because one has to you know, look and say, one starts to see, for example, well, what about, um, what about you know, mortality? So it is 1,600 people. This is Honig et al.'s study with about um, 1,600 people. Telomerate was measured here at time zero, okay? And then followed up for about 15, 14, 15 years. And this is just simply all cause mortality in this community based part of the study. Uh, the age range was this. And what you see is a graded um, probability, probability of all cause death um, based on telomeres, where the shortest have the highest uh, chance of, um, of dying in this follow up period. And this was measured here and then in a graded way with the longest one. It's a probability here. So we're looking at probabilities here, but we can see a, you know, in this study, I'll show you another very new example at the end, uh, you see this. Uh, uh, even dementia, this was only in the women in this group. They don't know if it was lack of power or if there's a true man or a difference. But the longest telomere people did pull out as being protected uh, from subsequent dementia diagnosis in the situation where you measured the telomeres early here and then followed up in this case about 10 million years of what you can see is that those people with longest telomeres overall had a continuous uh, situation of a shorter, sorry, a lower probability of a dementia diagnosis somewhere in the subsequent time. Uh, this is the Brunick study from um, Europe. It's, it's, about, it's about 800 people at this point that was published telomere length measured at the beginning, and then following out incidents, new diagnoses, and mortality in the subsequent, in this case, um, 10 years. They've carried it out further now. Again, we see a graded set of responses. Telomere length court tertile here predicted um, incidences, and, and interestingly, mortality uh, from, in this case, unlike what I showed you, which was all causes uh, of death, this is mortality in this, again, uh, population-based <coughs> study. So these were not people who carry mutations, these are people in the population. So this is an example, and here's one, again, same group of people are now looking at cardiovascular disease, various manifestations, cardiovascular disease, so stroke, myocardial infarction, and vascular disease. And again, you see this graded set of responses in the sense of the following, the statistical probability of a subsequent diagnosis was predicted to this degree at least by what the telomere length was at the beginning of the 10 year period and then incidences are, are followed over the years here. So, so quite an interesting statistical relationship is shown up there. So we got interested uh, by sort of happenstance really, which I think is an important thing that happens in rich scientific and clinical environments where people interact and talk to each other and ask questions in unexpected ways. We got interested in something which I would have told you um, some years ago but couldn't have been further away from any of the science that I ever did. And that was the question of chronic psychological stress. Now, what I mean by this, and I need to define it right away, is a severe kind of psychological stress which is very much characterized by the person not having a control of the situation and severe enough that clinically such um, stress often for years has been quantitatively related to being a risk factor for certain diseases and uh, particularly prominent, for example, is cardiovascular disease because there are very good studies you know, like 29,000 people in six continents, this was one of the six prominent risk factors for cardiovascular disease, just as one example. So this is very universal, and uh, at least, you know, in this clinical connection here. And so um, a colleague of mine who studies chronic psychological stress uh, and very interested in the physiological aspects, and she was a junior researcher, Dr. Lisa Apple, now the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF, and she said, what happens to people's telomeres when, they, um, when they're under chronic stress? I said, I don't know. And, uh, so then we, then we started to collaborate, and we collaborated with Richard Cawthorn at the University of Utah, who was also measuring telomere 
Link, who was interested in the genetic, among other factors. And, and I'm just going to show you these old results because they then um, turned out to be replicated in other studies as well. Now, this was a situation that met the classic definition of this chronic psychological stress I've talked about. So these mothers have a biologically a biological child who's chronically ill. It was a variety of things, autism, gut disorders, inherited disorders of different kinds. They had been in this situation for varying numbers of years, and they were otherwise frankly healthy the screening. Screening for eligibility for the study was carefully done so that everything was as uniform as possible, excepting the situation that they were in, their control mothers. But right across the sample, the level of telomerase was half those in the high stress versus the low stress. And, and by the way, just remember, I told you that half the telomerase gene dosage gives you very severe situations if you inherit that situation. And telomere length was shorter. And um, this was reached statistical significance. Uh, so this was our very first observation. And, uh, and, and it intrigued us because you know, we really, you know, I don't think we had any reason necessarily to expect this, but there it was. And, um, Furthermore, um, an interesting other thing happened, and that was if you looked at the, just the caregiving mothers, if you looked at the number of years she was in this situation, sorry, the scale is one, the scale actually is 12 years here. So one to 12 years, and if you, no matter how much you correct for all the obvious things that you correct for, like age and other physiological measures done in the mothers, it was still a relationship of, it indicated with, of course, scatter, these are humans, that there was a relationship between the number of years she was in the situation and the um, you know, telomere shortness. And you couldn't even make this go away, even if you looked at perceived stress levels, which varied a lot in this cohort, but that didn't even make this relationship go away. So that was a hint that there was causality here. Okay, and that was the first hint of causality. Subsequent studies have really um, at that point, you know, there are several studies. I've listed a few of ours we did um, uh, with Mr. Apple and many other colleagues now at UCSF and elsewhere, and many other groups now, really are showing that this relationship is there. So there's a relationship, it's a quantitative relationship. So now, uh, so what sorts of things modulated? It's a very modulatable relationship, I should say. Remember, we're talking about a statistical relationship, and you want to see what things what pathways are involved, what things interact with. I want to give just this um, example here. Uh, here's another cohort, but this is a much older cohort of women in a very common situation with the aging population, and that is uh, she's the primary caregiver for her, um, or usually in this study, spouse, husband, who has dementia of one kind or another, often Alzheimer's, but with all dementias together. She's the one who for years is primarily looking after this individual with, as we know, the severe situation that dementia brings to an individual or family. Now, what is this complex table was the statistical sort of data for what I want to just point out and simplify for. So these women, are, uh, it turned out that when you looked at the amount of exercise they did on a daily basis, this is average minutes, right? So this was a graded series of average when you divided them up into how much exercise they did. As a group, there was a relationship with telomere shortness and, um, and, and stress level, and you know, replicated, that was one of the replications of that first study I showed you about with the younger women who were caregivers for their child in this case. This is now for the spouse or the stories. And so uh, what happened was that if you now said, what is the relationship that telomere shortness had with the stress level, which was also done by our uh, actually a complex self-report uh, that assesses her perception of the stress. Interestingly, it's quote subjective, but it has this quantitative readout in this molecular measure of telomere average length. Basically, the more exercise she did, the more the relationship with stress simply just washed away, and it was in a very graded fashion. So that was important because it was graded. Uh, so basically, the more exercise, the less effect one saw in terms of the relationship between stress and telomere shortness. And it didn't have to be huge numbers of exercise minutes actually before this effect really started um, washing away. So that's an interesting thing. And that's turning out in other studies 
to be an example of something that you quite often see. There's a relationship between stress and then some other factor. We've replicated this exercise relationship in um, at least one other study now, and so this is not just this particular group of individuals. Uh, I'll show you a few other things just, just sort of interesting. This is a very healthy group of um, a area of women who were chosen as very healthy people without any obvious um, stress or situations, or of course there will be a range of situations that they have perceived stress related to, and then ones who sleep better actually have quantifiably better telomeres than those who don't. <laughs> this is following three month patterns of sleep. Um, and uh, very interesting properties of um, sort of how people's general mental well-being is. And we've seen it in various ways, but this is an interesting one in which a tendency to have your mind wander. So those of you who are sitting in this lecture room whose minds are wandering, wishing you weren't here, wishing you were doing some work, something else, uh, well, the better attentional presence really correlated with um, telomere length. Like, like, so, <laughs> and, and this is taken, no, you know, I'm being semi facetious, but, but, but this is sort of one measure of mental well being, if you will, is, is this sort of ability uh, not to be, you know, wandering off and worrying about this, that, and the other, but able to actually have attentional presence. So I think this is really quite interesting because, you know, this seems to be very different, and yet here it is blood cell telomeres, white blood cell telomeres, showing quantitative relationships. We've seen it in other small studies as well, but this one we had a good number here. And these were really healthy um, middle-aged women. Nothing was um, physically wrong with these, these people. Uh, and, and one interesting thing we have now coming out soon is um, we, we did actually a, a, um, a prospective randomized placebo control trial of fish oil supplement and there was you know, different doses. And, and interestingly, the ratio of in, measured in the individuals uh, of omega-3 to omega-6 is the ratio of those that in the individuals um, that turned out to be associated with longer telomeres at the end of a four-month um, trial of you know, it was again um, randomized placebo control perspective. So this is just the beginning. These these happen to be um, uh, people in the Midwest, they're, they're somewhat obese. I don't know if this relationship is going to hold everywhere. Like every study, the result was found for the study group. Uh, this, this was again something. But it actually uh, very much was in concordance with a study we'd done with about 600 individuals where we looked at how much the telomere length fell over a five year period. And that was predicted by, interestingly, their omega 3 content. This was a study we published about a couple of years ago, and, um, and so the really content predicted how much of this telomere fell. The significance of that, and this was again in a middle-aged population who were actually not very healthy, they had no heart disease. But the significance of that is that there's a good epidemiology that is related to omega-3 uh, fatty acids um, to cardiovascular, both progression and risk. So there's a very robust clinical literature. Um, with omega-3 with respect to cardiovascular disease. So this was interesting to see it in this particular kind of measure. One thing I think is, is really quite serious to think about is what I told you was the sorts of things that we think of as diseases of aging. And the uh, measures by and large, as I told you, that I told you about were done in adult and sometimes middle-aged or in elderly populations. And so that was thought to be, well, you know, this is where the you know, telomere shortening would be showing up. Now, what's emerging, I've just put four examples of studies up because we had the privilege of collaborating with people who were doing these, but there are other studies, the same thing. What's emerging is that factors in early life, severe adversity of different kinds in early life, are associated with persistent effects where you measure telomere shortness in adults, even middle-aged to elderly adults, when it's related back to things that happen very early, including, interestingly, intrauterine stress exposure in the study we published last, last year. And what you see is this quantitative relationship. This was the number of childhood trauma, of traumatic categories that was related. In this study, people had post-traumatic stress disorder. Others have seen it without post-traumatic stress disorder. So I mean, very severe things like death of a parent, you know, those sorts of abuses, very severe kinds, right? sexual abuse, 
that so the number of categories was quantitatively related to telomere shortness in young to middle-aged adults. And curiously low educational attainment. I'm going to show you that data. But that's interesting because years and years later, even when you correct for income, job status, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, health indices, that, that, that persistent is very interesting. And uh, even lifetime cumulative de duration of depression. And this was untreated days of depression, that show, untreated days that showed this relationship. So, so I think there's very interesting things to think about uh, because, in fact, it's no surprise. It's long been documented that adverse things in childhood and early development play out later in life as higher hypertension, higher diabetes, heart disease, incidents, a lot of things like this. This is a very interesting hint that perhaps this pathway might have a contributory role in that long known set of associations. I'm not saying it's the only thing by any means, but it looks quantitatively as though we can now consider this along with other pathways, along with other pathways. Um, so, so obviously there are a lot of very intriguing things and lots of very interesting questions start to come up with all of these studies. And I've just given you various examples to make certain points. And so one would like to do this more and more comprehensively. And so a few years ago, um, as a result of stimulus funding that was given to NIH shortly after the big financial you know, uh, crisis of 2008, a big amount of money was put into NIH to stimulate uh, research. And one of the things that stimulated was uh, the ability to apply for grants to do things that you wouldn't be able to do easily otherwise. And so this, we had the great good fortune of joining in to an existing study between a large health organization, Health Kaiser Permanente's Complete Health Plan in the Western US and UCSF, the Institute of Genetics. So Kathy Schaefer leads the Kaiser Permanente uh, part, which uh, I'll describe in a minute, and Neil Rich, the genetic, uh, in this case, GWAS part at UCSF, a collaborative thing. And so they had um, 100,000 people, biospecimens, comprehensive clinical data, electronic med medical records, leaving going back 20 years for about half of these 100,000 people. These are all adults, 20 to 95 years old. Um, and, uh, and then a lot of survey data from them about their lives, their environments, their neighborhoods, their situations, and, and you know, from their databases in California, one could get environmental exposures. All of these were broadly consented and were actually reconsented for this study. Uh, so, so what what this is is it produces a lot of um, uh, potential useful information. Eventually, it's going to go into databases where it can be mined. We talked before. It's a very rich set of data. So we joined in this and said, well, well, if you make the DNA, why don't we measure telomere length? So we built a special robot to do that. I'm a very talented one person built the robot uh, from parts. But you know, it doesn't take huge numbers of people to do something. So we built a robot because it was uh, Arab money. That meant you know, American recovery and something like that. You know, it meant money you had to spend out in two years. So we didn't to do it. So we built a little robot to do this. And we gained a lot of experience in benchtop robotics, liquid handling and so on, for handling samples of up to a few thousand. And so it was an incremental step to just build something that would just run through with very high accuracy this um, large data, this large number of samples. And so it was all very automated and so forth. And then we got very good advice from the statisticians and people actually in the physics and mathematical side of things about how you do the sampling in ways that you can correct for technical errors and get yourself a robust data set. So that's what we did. And I'll just show you the one that actually was presented at the Human Genetics, International Human Genetics Meeting in San Francisco just uh, yesterday. Um, and so uh, basically, if you look at people with this short, this is 100,000, 20 to 95 uh, years old, and you just look, uh, even if you correct for as many things as possible, and this is uh, an early listing, we've done more corrections, we meaning the collaborators who analyze all this way of amazing data. And so people who are in the shortest quartile of telomere length, if you normalize their subsequent mortality in the two years after this DNA was collected, 
So this is prospectively looking how likely were they to die in the next two years. Those whose telomeres were in the shortest quarter, and it's normalized to one, were more likely to die in that subsequent two years than the others. Right. So there it is. And you correct um, uh, you know, with more and more models, and this relationship is, is still there. So, so I think this is really interesting because it certainly echoes what Holy Gadal had shown in that community study. And various other studies had shown different results. So there was always a bit of a mirror, and you don't quite know. But I think with 100,000 people, we got a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, idea that there, there is a significant uh, statistical, statistical only, and emphasize, you know, it's about 20% difference, right? But it's a statistically significant difference. So I think that's interesting because obviously there's biology and other factors underlying this. With age, this is the same uh, cohort, 20 to 95. Each one of these data points is just showing the mean. There's a wide variation, I should point out. A lot of variation, okay, for each you know, age group. I'm just showing the mean, the standard error of the mean. But we reproduce what we show in the literature, the general trend downwards. Um, but most mortality in the cohort, you know, it's known from the cohort generally, is, is occurring around here. And interestingly, those who do survive longer, interestingly, their mean telomere length is just measured in this snapshot of their age when this was measured um, is, is going up. And then the male-female difference is quite obstructive. Many people thought estrogen would be a major driver of the differences that had statistically been seen between men and women. But people hadn't had the power to sort of sort out the scatter, scatter women, there's a lot of scattering in this, and see the, uh, the there's a split in the mean. Now remember, there's big overlapping ranges here. You know, this will tell you if you're a man or a female, or a woman or a man. But it, it's, we talk about statistics of large numbers of humans here. And, and this happens postmenopausally. So most of the estrogen action will be before that. So right away, here's the human um, data calling into question the basic science that has said there's estrogen receptors as the TERP gene promoter, so we could explain telomere length being greater in females, maybe that was sufficient. So it just goes to show that a simplified molecular explanation doesn't get borne out by actual data of actual human beings. Again, the same upward trend after the major mortality here. Um, this, I just reproduced something that we uh, uh, collaborated with Stecto and um, Marmot and others in the big British UK civil servants cohort that have been studied for years. And in these middle-aged to elderly people, uh, interestingly enough, regardless of their jobs and their income and their health indices, whether they had finished secondary school or gone on to more and more advanced secondary school or university or higher degrees, related to theory shortness in these now middle-aged to elderly people. Very interesting, uh, which all of these different bars are trying to correct with different models. Was it income? Was it health? You, know, you couldn't make the relationship go away. Uh, it seems you know, quite variability here, but these were very statistical, this trend here. And just to show, show you an example, in the 100,000, we've now reproduced that, um, in, you know, just the same idea, right? If you didn't complete high school, uh, this is uh, the same sort of thing. So uh, we haven't published that, but there's a richness in this data, which I think will be very interesting. At the moment, we're systematically saying what things that have been published before are or are not reproduced. We can break them down into ethnic groups in a lot of different ways. But um, you know, we think that this might be one of the kinds of approaches to this general question of what pathways and mechanisms affect genetic and non-genetic determinants of aging-related diseases. And I think the message we're given very much is that uh, you know, one intriguing input to this is, is chronic stress. We can relate to shorter telomeres. Particular genetic information and models have indicated that shorter telomeres certainly can cause disease impact. Right? So we have two relationships. How do they fit? That's going to be important to try and quantify to what degree the chronic stress relationship to disease impact is through this pathway, through others. I have certainly no reason to think it's going to be alone through that. 
disease itself. We have good reason to think that in turn starts playing back as the pathological changes happen. So, so you know, this has to be analyzed and thought through in um, you know, rigorous fashion. In addition, there's the candidates one wants to think about uh, for this in terms of the effect on this molecular marker. Here are just three examples that come directly from human studies where you could say, well, what pathways biochemically may affect telomere um, maintenance in the actual human beings? Stress hormones is an obvious one. In fact, this is our old data from our original caregiver mother's study. If you simply divide the whole cohort, both caregiver mothers and the control mothers, into long telomere and short telomere by a median split, the stress hormones were significantly higher, these are the ones listed, in the shorter versus the longer telomere half of the cohort. That sort of thing is starting to be seen in others. And in the lab, you can analyze directly in cells, when you're looking at fresh T cells, for example, the effects of cortisol, and then start to analyze inside the cell what molecular pathways affect telomerase. Uh, for example, which in turn will be a measure of the capacity for telomere maintenance. So, so one can go from humans and then look for pathways. Uh, and uh, so we're doing that, others are doing this. Systemic inflammatory factors, particularly IL-6 and TNF-alpha, were particularly related to the odds of having short telomeres, shorter, you know, by some quarter or median split. This is in a study of about 1,200 people. Here, looking uh, at a systemic uh, uh, oxidative stress, which in turn you know, is related to pro-inflammatory procedures. And so you know, these might very well be related. This might be related because we see impacts on uh, ability of T cells, for example, to function properly. So you know, these might all be related to each other. Uh, but certainly, again, there's a relationship with oxidative stress ratio. This is now systemic measured by serum to acetoxate ratio of vitamin C in this case, and this see relationship with the team shortness. And, and others have again reported this. So again, the same things are showing up. So there's biochemical influences that one can certainly start to think about teasing out. The important question is going to be what are the quantitatively more predominant ones? Because we know there are hundreds of genes. In yeast, over 300 genes can, if just mutated or even reduced in activity, greatly affect telomere length in a single cell organism, yeast. You know, this has been shown in um, genome uh, studies. So you can imagine how complex this would be in humans. And now if we add the environmental and uh, you know, and behavioral and I suspect societal things that impact on that, we add those in. We, we are going to, you know, we're going to have lots of pathways involved. So you have to start thinking, what are the rate limiting ones that matter, right? Because lots and lots of, everybody's favorite gene, of course, includes his telomeres, you know. That's no surprise, he's told us that, you know. <laughs> the question is, which ones actually matter, and which ones are malleable? So, so just to put it back then and finish it in perspective then, you know, we, we know that as we think about the universe of age-related diseases, many of which clinically are comorbid, carry risk factors for each other if you have one, risk factors for the others, such as you know, cardiovascular diabetes, and co-risk factors, um, including, of course, the very serious aspects which, which relate to mental cognitive disorder and depression, again, diseases of aging, and again, we show comorbidities with some of these. So all of those inputs um, you know, we know play into the quantitative risks for these diseases. And so what we've added then to this you know, well-established set of ideas is that there is an aspect which we can say that it is causally related in certain cases where it's possible to study this in detail. Certainly this has a chance of being causally related with these aspects of these diseases, and of course many other pathways too. I mean, this is, I put it in the center, but I don't want to imply it. it's necessarily quantitatively a major part, but it looks like a very common underlying thread which shows interactions 
with the sets of other things that will lead to uh, risks for these diseases. So it's important, I think, to try and understand these risks and try and understand more and more what's going on biologically, because then more and more you have some chance of thinking about how you might forestall them before they become, you know, a completely advanced case of diabetes or, you know, drastic cardiovascular disease needing very, you know, major surgery or intervention. So, so I think this fits in that general category. So, so just to summarize, we've learned about telomere maintenance by starting with um, really basic science questions. And we learned that that impairs replenishment of cells using model systems, but the principles behind cells are very general throughout eukaryotes. That's one of the great principles learned from molecular biology, and that turns out to be true in human cells as it is for model organisms where we began this very basic research journey. And now, when one starts to combine this sort of information with information about humans, then we find something that I'm going to summarize, perhaps a little bravely, but uh, I think this looks like a, a potential for being a root factor. It's there. It's underlying all the time in the population in general. And I'm talking in general, but maybe you know, people who do better or worse at this. Uh, these mechanisms and etiologies of diseases now, obviously, it's interacting with them. You can see it in the genetic models, but there's interactions here. And these other disease processes, of course, are crucial, but it seems to be something underlying these. And I think, interestingly, it might be a rational way of thinking about why comorbidity is so common in diseases that otherwise sort of seem to look as if they're so separate, you know, the heart versus the pancreas, you know, but here's something that, as an underlying general factor, um, can make some sense of comorbidity. And uh, that, by the way, potentially includes cancers because the um, impaired immune system and the propensity for genomic instability, both of which are now understood to contribute to cancers in different ways, that also is a consequence of having inadequate telomere maintenance. I didn't talk much about cancers in this lecture, I'm a little more tomorrow, a little bit more focus on that. But, um, but that doesn't exclude the situation of cancers, which have very high telomerase in the full malignant cells, but we're talking about the early stages that get the cells on the way to disease. So I think this is um, the kind of context in which uh, I think we do want to be thinking about diseases, uh, not only really treating diseases which you know, drastically requires action and plenty of research, but that in turn has started to be very informative about ways that we can start thinking about preempting the earlier stages of diseases. So I just want to thank our collaborators, uh, um, particularly recently and us the current folks in the lab, and um, particularly draw attention to Zhe Lin and to um, Lin Fang and Kyle Lappin. Uh, they did much of the work I was telling you about. Uh, they might sort of lead the team, particularly uh, Zhe, uh, for the team of people looking at telomere lengths and telomerase in clinical collaborations. We have large numbers of collaborative groups. I haven't even begun to mention them all. I just mentioned a few of the CSF and Kaiser that I highlighted in today's talk. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. 
neurogenesis is something that goes on lifetime in mice and may well go on in humans, so neurogenesis will require continual replenishment. Secondly, I draw your attention to a very instructive um, set of studies where people have looked at specific defects in immune system cells and shown they can lead to uh, what we would classify as behavioral things. Mario Kopecki's group, uh, very interestingly, I won't go into history, but basically in the myeloid lineage of hemopoietic cells, if you make a specific mutation in a Hox gene, or to be involved in you know, the developmental control, you induce in mice a particular form of obsessive compulsive disorder behavior, which you, know, you think would be very new. Then that mutation is specifically, you can put it very specifically in the myeloid lineage of the hemopoietic cells and transplant it in. So actually, I think but that simply is a vignette to emphasize that the immune system and the neural system have long, more and more now, been recognized that they are highly intertwined. The whole system, we're talking about a system here. My point was to say cells are not just isolated from each other, organs are not isolated from each other. We, you know, more and more, uh, we have the tools now in research to think about the complexities of the system because it's totally artificial to think about one disease without the system. Of course, it's necessary to build up from the building blocks that what was done so much in research. Now, you know, this is just an example of these things are very integrated. Depression and cancer, uh, those co-risks, if you treat elderly people for depression very seriously and aggressively, very elderly cohorts, their mortality, five year survival is better, it turns out the big difference was in the category of cancers. So I think the instructive thing is that humans have taught us by these sorts of things that we can't just sort of separate the two. Yes, the vascular thing, uh, as you say, you might have thought it's all neurons. So my answer is forget what you read in textbooks. <laughs> all reviews, always we have to be looking at the data sets and saying, what are they telling us? Because the preconceptions we have, I have had them too. You know, uh, I thought, oh, you know, mice live very short lives, they have very long telomeres, and then I have this one, we related to aging. It's related to this very specific set of things in aging. By the way, I don't think it's related to maximum human lifespan. I think that actually that's other genetic pathways, but it looks as though telomere uh, length is positive, co be correlated with longer survival after the major mortality in the last second So there's a role here, but I think it actually is more to do with the very common diseases that characterize aging rather than the sort of you know, maximum hard stop of lifespan, just in case anybody was going to ask me about immortality. <laughs> <laughs> it's health span. It, well, it actually relates to health span, I think, much more than uh, maximum lifespan. Just on curiosity, I'm wondering, are there any good correlation for the lack of expectation of different animals for example, their telling effects? Yeah. It's a mixed bag. People have looked among the um, mammals, and you get a very complex picture. People have looked in bird species, and there's quite a wonderful paper that's published about six years of the Bell Hall, in which they looked at about half a dozen bird species, and they knew the maximum lifespan of these bird species. And they looked at the telomere length in the red blood cells. Birds very conveniently keep the nuclei in the red blood cells, so it's very easy to get a drop of blood and analyze telomere length. And they found that the rate of telomere shortening, it's not all going down. In birds it stays the same, and some species it goes up, and that rate is quantitatively related to maximum lifespan. So that was in the birds. I don't know if that will hold. As I say, in mammals, it's a very complex picture that nobody could make sense of. So I think that, uh, I want to emphasize, this is only one thing. So I think when we think of humans, we're going to probably have to look at our rather weird biological situation that we're in, because you know we're in a situation where our lifespans were not necessarily what was perhaps historically, evolutionarily, what was actually selected for. But we're in an artificial situation where we now live well beyond, you know, the reproductive, um, uh, you know, success part 
of our lives where that obviously was where our selection of which case of course childhood mortality and things like that. So we're now looking at situations where we don't have any predictions from evolution per se. We're so weirdly, you know, we're living in a weirdly protected environment. <laughs> and the normal sort of selective pressures are now so distorted in humans. But as a mother's question just to try and think about, you know, A, biologically, how this play out. But my point is also, there's a dearth of information. You know, it might be that it might be in certain branches of evolution, there's straightforward relationships. You know, the birds are an interesting hint, but I don't know about you know, other creatures. Everyone wonders about tortoises and Africa, you know, uh, African grey carrots live a long time, so that would be interesting to see that extent to the focus. Most of your uh, statistical studies, I think, is based on long term observations. But I noticed the vitamin supplement you know, was done in only four months. Yeah. And I um, wonder okay. the, whether the, that is enough to. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, I'd like to sort of correct it. I mean, we had to get a lot of data, first of all, right, to see what to even look for. So that's what you might call phenomenological. In fact, there are various pilot studies going on. I mean, there are a lot of progress uh, now uh, to actually look at a much more prospective, randomized, placebo control state of um, analyses. One had to look first and find out what was the situation in humans that. Um, you know, that is a necessary first thing to plan any study. So, um, but in fact, the data are um, more and more going towards these uh, other kinds. So, can you actually look at the difference between uh, people who take the vitamin and how do you take the vitamin? No, no, no. Those are really disappointing in the clinical studies, and so I'm not sure if we're going to waste too much time on that because things like vitamins that they all turned out to have minimal effects. And so, I think. Guided by what's known, there's no special reason to look, except that we don't know how that might interact with other factors. We're hoping the 100,000 will be helpful because subgroups of people within that will have enough statistical power to perhaps be able to answer such questions. Um, and so uh, the omega 3 was based on extensive data from the cardiovascular field. So that was based on um, a good reason to. To do that, everybody wants a magic pill, and I'm afraid that probably is not <laughs> okay. Although I will say, exercise phenomenologically, the observation and tie-ins of exercise have been consistent with um, longer tailways, including twin studies, and all sorts of things. We're now doing a prospective randomized trial with a group in Columbia who actually know what they're talking about in terms of exercise. So I would emphasize we're not collaborating with people, we're collaborating with people who know what they're talking about in terms of these studies. You know, we come in with our measures and our understanding of the telomere biology, but I want to hugely give you know, credit where the credit's due to all of these studies because they're difficult to do well, but fascinating to interact with. Yeah, so vitamins, I'd say, yeah, you know, <laughs> I have no data for that. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we know that telomere and shortening uh, play a role in cancer progression. And however, the upregulation of telomere rates is also observed in cancer. Uh, how do you connect these two events? They're, they're, they're very different stages. What we talk about when you talk about risk for cancer is probably in the whole sequence of many events that take place, genetic and epigenetic. When people measure this correlation of high telomerase in cancer cells, by definition, the cancer is highly advanced because it was clinical, it was discovered. That's the end of a long series of uh, processes, right? So you look at this end result and it's high. So it's characteristic in malignant cancer cells that it's high, but statistically, you know, it's not every cancer. Some use alternative pathways, which are interesting, but a great majority. Uses. But remember, highly malignant cancer cells, clinically advanced cancers, that's what the clinic picks up. It doesn't pick up the early stages, but the genetic and these human studies I've shown you would implicate earlier stages. And we mustn't forget the immune system as well. So we've been thinking a lot about cancers, you know, in the past was the cell autonomous changes. Now the recognition is, of course, its host and microenvironment 
changes that can be equally important for the treatment of etiology. And so that could be a consequence of immune dysfunction or of immune uh, you know, impairment, for example. So we have to keep open the causality that the genetics is going to be at. So genetics doesn't lie, so we have to then scurry after it and try and understand it. So I, I, I have no trouble correlating the two because cancer is not just an event, it's a series of processes and we look at the very, very late stages. That's what tomorrow is, tends to be high. Again, I'm glad you asked the question because it, it, I'm not, I didn't do with cancer today, I'll talk about more tomorrow with cancer per se. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Dr. Becker. I'm a freshman from the Taipei Medical University, and I have two questions. The first one is that since that you mentioned a non genetic factor may affect the length of tumors, and I'm wondering that uh, whether the early, early stage or later stage of human might affect the length. Of tumors more. And oh, sorry, so could you clarify what do you mean by the early stage of human? Uh, because you said that some children tra yes, trauma yes, yeah, may affect yes, the yes, and So yes. uh, I mean, it's younger or older stage. Of I don't life. quantitatively. So, so really, you can ask your question and say what quantitatively is the most important, right? Yeah. Um, and so the answer is uh, it probably, <laughs> you know. It probably depends. If you look at newborn telomeres, you can discern a degree of genetic heritability of telomere length in the normal population. So the subtraction, people put, you know, ranges from 20 to even 80 percent. I think the 80 percent is probably unlikely to be really likely. However, if you do the same studies more and more with age, we've seen it in our recent big studies, heritability component of telomere length as a quantitative trait diminishes with age. So by the time you're much older, a lot of the heritability part has washed away, but not a lot. So now, how much of that then, what about the non-heritable part? Because that has to be interacting with it. And so one can discern these effects of childhood um, on, for example, uh, clinical outcomes. One can discern them on telomere length in the adults again. Uh, sorry, childhood effects, things happening in childhood that are severe play out, and, and also prenatally, even things like fetal, I'm uh, sorry, birth weight has really clear consequences much later in life in terms of statistical risks. Telomere shortness we see is the same factors that are having effects. We haven't put the two together to see to what degree the telomere shortness aspect is related you know, to the risks for the diseases. That was why I said that it's maybe a pathway through telomere length, we can, the shortness, we can certainly say that's the case. But I'm sure there are other pathways. How important are they? How much does it vary with the disease type? You know, these are all questions that one needs to sort of frame in a quantitative fashion, because then one can do um, sort of more focused science and get more precision to these answers the very good questions, but one has to then ask the question in a way that you frame it in a rigorous way. So when you say more or less, I can't give you an answer, and I suspect it might depend, you know, maybe it's different for diabetes and heart disease, or different for cancer and later life depression. So there's lots to learn. And that was only one question. Another <laughs> question is that, um, I'm wondering that, uh, is, there, uh, is there any difference in uh, the land of uh, telomeres in humans chromosomes. I, I mean, yes, yes, yes. So there's a great deal of details, um, you know, cell biology studies that people have done. So you can look at the telomeres in every cell, you know, and measure them by an insatiable hybridization. And if you do it right, you find that there's a distribution of telomere lengths, and that's extremely instructive as to understand the dynamics of telomere elongation and shortening. And individual chromosomes, does chromosome 18 have shorter telomeres than chromosome 4? The very few studies that have um, tried to look at this show that there's a lot of polymorphism. One person's chromosome 18, uh, if you see which telomeres get shorter when you take the cells out of the body, might be chromosome 18 in some person. You take another person and it's not chromosome 18 at all. So the differences are there. You know, as I said, if you 
you think of hundreds of different influences on telomere maintenance, then how that plays out in terms of the sub telomere, which is after all what the chromosomal you know, context will uh, consist of in part, is going to be influenced by a lot of genetic factors. So the so you might think, well, it's just hopeless, right? But it turns out, as I said, remarkably, when you do this simple-minded thing of measuring average telomere length, and you can do it in a mixture of cell types, which is even when those Kaiser studies were done in saliva DNA, which is a mixture of cell types, you can still see these quantitative relationships. The details are we know there's a lot going on at different cellular types, there's you know different sorts of average telomere lengths and different subtypes. We know that individual cells have different chromosome ends that are longer and shorter, but that, that, can, that changes stochastically as the cells replicate. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. And that leads one into the molecular understanding of what are the actual processes that give you addition or loss of individual telomeres. So the answer is yes, there's individual chromosomes. At any one moment, the chromosome will have different lengths and anyone named chromosome, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, that will have a trend in people, but in a different person. It's a different Thank you very much. Thank you. So the value of all of this is when one looks at the details, one can probe into certain specific molecular mechanisms. I mean, you know, a child of my lab does research on very basic telomere mechanisms still. And you know, we work with yeast, human cells and you know there's a lot to be understood by probing in at the molecular level. But I really enjoy the juxtaposition with something at a very different level and looking at the whole person, the whole macro phenotype, and then relating it quantitatively to this very quantitative sort of trait which you could think of as telomere thing. So the two play back and forth, as I said the basic science of these other observations, they, they continue to inform each other back and forth because they let you pose different kinds of questions and training in ways that you can experimentally try to understand. So a lot more work to be done. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you. Excuse me, I got a question about, uh, because I have read a paper uh, published in uh, 2005, by a German uh, scientist. The title is Oxidative Stress and Agent is Agent is Sustained Deficiency. And I personally think uh, the shortening of telomere is actually the re result instead of the cause. I think uh, the cause. That's, that's why genetics is so useful, because we can look at the cause. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, my personal view is uh, chronic uh, oxidative stress uh, caused the shortening of the telomere. That's true in vitro. Yeah. So like every in vitro observation, one then, so, so as I said, there's hundreds of mechanisms that act on telomere length maintenance. The trick now is to understand which of those quantitatively, you know, which is the rate limiting one, because that's what matters. There's lots of molecular pathways, biochemical pathways. The thing that we want to understand is which is the one that quantitatively matters. In my telomere shortening, is not in lab mice, it's not quantitatively a major feature in terms of wild type mice, but we live for 80 years and not, not for two. And so what becomes rate limiting it turns out to be the question. So I, um, I, I hesitate to say one pathway is the one, you know, your favorite pathway is the one that quantitatively matters. I say there's contributions, but one has to be super careful about actually having data that would say one or the other, because we all have our own passionate models. I mean, I was a skeptic of all of this, okay? I love telomeres dearly, and I thought there's no way this is going to play out in a quantitative way in humans. So uh, I, I think that it's you know, important that one should always keep open-minded. Sounds like you love oxidative stress, and I have no question, I think there's real relationships there. Are those the quantitatively major ones? They may well be, but I don't know yet about the respect to telomeres. But wonderful questions to ask. Uh, excuse me, I, I got a theory. I, I think that because all uh, material was composed by atoms, and uh, outside of atoms is an uh, uh, electron.
path. So if we, if we uh, view the, the physical world from that kind of scale, tiny scale, we will uh, encounter a lot of electric electron crap. And, and because the, the interior of the cell is a reducing environment, if that environment was, was perturbated or dis disturbed, then uh, the oxidative stress will kind uh, of uh, cause the phenomenon well, it could. However, uh, I think that one would want to decompose it, to sort of parse that question out into what exactly would be the way that happens. I mean, I, I understand philosophy, but I don't know, if, because you know, the cells put a great deal of energy into repair pathways, I don't know to what extent that gets actually effectively counterbalanced by all of those processes that are in the cells. Uh, it exists, I, I know it's right, but thermodynamics exists still. <laughs> so, right. But the, the question is, you know, living cells put tremendous amounts of energy into, um, you know, complex regulatory pathways, into doing things that run counter to uh, the sort of laws of the physical universe that play outside cells. I'm not saying cells that are immune from them, but we do have to take into account how much tremendous complexity of energy goes into it. Uh, entropy and oxidative stress. So we could endlessly discuss that, but I think the question is, can one formulate it into a testable experiment? I think that's, that's the thing that one wants to bring together those, um, those framework questions into, well, can one actually test it? So I think it's a great question to ask, but I don't know a good experiment. <laughs> okay, I think because of the interest of time, we have to uh, stop here. Uh, let's thank Professor Beckman again.